quick, um, I just need some light, a few quick announcements. The Jamesburg Home Group and Overcomers Outreach Home Group um, can meet via Zoom, and there's passwords and such for that, codes. Um, there's been some great things happening with Food for the Soul. Uh, Friday, several families were fed. They did like a drive, drive up. Everybody's trying to be creative through all this. So they sent me some really cool pictures. What a blessing that was. Uh, another thing that's interesting is that I'm finding more and more church people or in our church telling me that they had the antibody test for COVID and they can't, once they have the antibodies, they can't, you know, that kind of attaches that whole herd immunity thing. So actually, I'm going to ask you, anybody in this church who is, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get it this week. I want to see, have I had it? Do I have the antibody? If that's the case, I can't, if it tries to come in me again, <laughs> epidemiology, I can't get it again, and I can't certainly pass it on to anybody else. So I'm going to try to do that this week. But if there's anybody in our fellowship who's had that test, um, please let me know. Okay, that's two people. So <laughs> that's awesome. So you're building up that herd immunity to keep people safe. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Got to love uh, all the modern technology we have to be able to deal with these issues. And uh, this morning, we're going to be in Revelation 3, verse 7 through 13. This morning, we're going to be in Revelation 3, 7 through 13. And the last time the message was titled, Church, Dead or Alive. The last time we looked at Sardis. Now, this is the Lord Jesus. He's looking at the church and he's saying, you're dead. You're spiritually dead. And you have to revive the things that are sort of on life support. You know, and again, in our physical eyes, we can see ministries that look big and exciting. But according to the Lord, they might be dead. You know, if Jesus Christ isn't in the center of church, then it's a dead church. You know, just as a religion or it's a social club. This morning, we're going to be in part two church dead or alive and we're going to look at the church of philadelphia and i have to chuckle because we are close to pennsylvania but that's not the philadelphia he's talking about he's talking about actually it was in asia minor at the time but this church was pretty awesome it had no constructive criticism from the lord and you know this is going to challenge us because we have to look at our own lives and even the uh, denominations that we are loyal to and realize sometimes we have to go outside of that because if Jesus says I want it this way and this is the purity that I expect then we have to do that so we're gonna look at the Church of Philadelphia nothing negative that he said about them and we're gonna look at this in five parts now as always we go through it in three stages or phases and basically you have the church at the time in Asia Minor that Jesus was speaking about you also have the church age, which is quite fantastic, which is an age of, over the last two millennia, the, these different church ages that have come and gone. And if you study church history over the last 2,000 years, you'll see this. History is awesome. It tells us a lot about a lot of things because it has no biases in it. And three, we're going to look at the church type. And this is where we really make an application. What ch type of church do I want to be part of? And what type of Christian do I want to be? So let's jump in. Verse 7. Revelation 3, verse 7. He says, And to the angel, or the messenger, of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, one out of five is, well, if we look at the actual church, Philadelphia had what all the other six churches had. It had culture, it had uh, the cities, right? It had pagan influence and all these things. But the church of Philadelphia, unlike the other churches, wasn't poisoned by the culture. Think about the Corinthian church, first and second Corinthians. They were poisoned by the surrounding culture. And we have to ask the same question in any of our local churches. You know, we like Philadelphia, where we don't go along with everything the culture says. Or are we setting a standard that Jesus speaks about in his word? So that's the cool thing about Philadelphia. So B, if you look at the church age, this looks like something between the mid-1700s. Now we're getting closer to today and the rapture. So remember, with every church age over the last 2,000 years, we're getting closer to today. So th let's look at this. The mid-1700s to the rapture or the harpazo, what are the marks of the Philadelphian church? Well, one is evangelism. Evangelism, the word has been tainted over the years. Some people have put a negative connotation to it, and that's a sad thing. And some people have misrepresented ev evangelicalism, but it really means euangelion, right? is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. That's true evangelism, God's word, the message of salvation. This church period, if you think about it, you go into your history books, which I love to do, you'll see some great awakenings and great revivals that people talk about. The great revivals that was in this time period from the mid-1700s to today. This, to me, is very powerful. He said you had a little bit of strength. The church wasn't a mass organization. It didn't have governmental power. It didn't have armies and navies, the Philadelphian church. But check it out. This was a period of time where Europe and the United States abolished slavery, most influenced by Christian abolitionists. That's exciting to me. There's this movie, uh, Amistad, which Steven Spielberg pointed out, and it was a slave ship that ended up in the United States. There was a mutiny. And our courts actually found that these people uh, were being held against their will as, you know, every human being has the right of liberty. And they were able to send them back to Africa and repatriate. Now, what's remarkable about that, if you look in the, watch the movie, which was a fascinating movie, Steven Spielberg, no real friend to Christianity, had no choice because I believe he bought the rights to the story. He had to put in the story about the Christian abolitionists. As a matter of fact, C.K., the actor was great. Uh, C.K. learns about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And C.K. brings the gospel of Jesus Christ back to Africa. So does God, you know, God's ideal is not that we would ever do something like this. But he took a bad situation. He was able to spread the gospel back to Africa. You know, God always can take these awful situations and turn them somehow into some type of blessing afterwards. But the Christians, there was a Christianity Today had an article, and it said that the unsung hero of, of the movie Amistad and Christianity Today went into all the facts of the, the men and women who were part of Christian abolitionism, who pushed really hard for these people to be f uh, freed and sent back to their home country. So they were the unsung heroes, even though Spielberg put a very small part of it out. This is a, a, an awesome church. Philadelphia. In Greek, it means brotherly love. C, a type of church. This is also a missionary church. Remember, they had a little strength, but they went out to the far reaches of the world and socialism and communism and, you know, all these oppressive governments went out with a little strength and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. Iran, North Korea, places you would never want to go being a Christian because Christianity is illegal. But this church with a little strength did a lot. This also is the faithful church. This is also, I would look at this as the non-denominational church focusing on God's word instead of doctrinal or denominational differences. It's not important. We all have a denomination, but what we have to understand is that those denominations can also be wrong in some of the things they do. We want to be more like Philadelphia. Where Thyatira and Sardis represented the majority denominations, Philadelphia represents the minority, but they did it right, and they had the power to do it right because of God. Now, it was a monolith. I, I, you hear me say this a lot. This church wasn't a monolith. That church wasn't a monolith. 
when Jesus criticized certain churches, there were good people in, that, in those churches where Jesus said, don't be like them. Continue to do it the way you, I, that I see you doing it. That purity in Christianity. So Philadelphia had this principle of obedience and purity, and they were sort of a monolith in their thought. Doesn't mean they didn't sin, but they did it right. This church was like Smyrna, who also was a monolith. And monolith means pretty much everybody is kind of agreeing with the, you know, they have the same mindset. They were not a divided church. Smyrna was also a monolith in that they were persecuted and they did the right thing, right? They were faithful to the Lord. And they were both monoliths, if we look at Smyrna and Philadelphia, because they both lived God's word and they applied God's word. And this is something that we should all desire to be a Philadelphian Christian. Verse 7, he says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Say, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So two out of five are opportunities. God says, and I'll paraphrase it, I make things happen. God's saying this to the church. You, you have a little strength, but it's me who makes things happen. It's me. And we see this, we often pray this in prayer. Somebody's agonizing over something and we pray, Lord, open the door that no one can shut and shut the door that no one can open. And sometimes when we could do A, B, or C, sometimes it's, it's really cool when God shuts the door to B and C. Well, I can only walk through A because that's all that he's provided. That's a blessing in prayer. You know, closed doors, if he closes it, that's a good thing. <laughs> He's probably protecting us from something. So we see this in Isaiah twenty two twenty two, the same exact terminology, Matthew 16 and 19 as well. So what is this open door to these people? Well, in the next chapter, chapter 4, we're going to see the open door to heaven. After the church age is finished, and that's a, a picture of the rapture. Uh, but we'll talk more about that to Harpazo. We'll get to that. And you can look at that. Uh, it's also an opp opportunity to do the impossible. This open door was an evangel evangelistic, evangelistic opportunity, my syllables were off, in remote and difficult places. Remember, this church has a little strength, but they did powerful things, not because they wanted to be a grandiose ministry, but if you think about what missionaries do, they go out there and they have to rely on support, a lot of times their health care doesn't follow them. They have to hope that there's enough money in the bank for their support to exist. They may have to live off the land. I mean, we've had some awesome missionaries. Uh, we had missionaries to Guatemala. We had missionaries we still do. Unfortunately, in Guatemala, one of our, he was a young guy, he got beat up by the authorities for spreading the gospel. They actually, they punctured his eardrum. They kicked him and beat him. Um, he's okay now. I actually saw him about a year ago. He came to the church just to say hello. Thank God he's doing okay. Um, we've had missionaries in Afghanistan who have had to hide their Bibles underground. Uh, and we've had missionaries that have gone into ISIS territory. So we, we really try to support, right, Africa. We have two missionaries in Africa. You know, uh, even when this whole thing with COVID hit and, and churches were taking a hit with uh, support, my staff and I got together and we prayed and we're like, you know what? I don't feel comfortable about lessening the support to missionaries. And you know what? We never did. Um, I'm not going to let fear drive my decisions. These people are remarkable people. And I'm glad that we were, it was unanimity. Right? Pastor Paul shaking his head regarding this decision to continue to support these missionaries. So powerful stuff. And I would say to those of you out there who think, well, you know, and then people do this as Christians. We see the big ministries on TV and Christians individual, individually think, well, what can I do? The problem is if you look at the big ministries and you focus on B.I.G., you're going to be, you're going to feel small. You're going to feel small. So stop focusing on the big and what is it in those small ways that you can bless people and do it. Because collectively, we could do far more than those big flashy ministries. Collectively, I say that. 
The church of Philadelphia had a little strength. They relied on the Lord's help. But sometimes today we see political and powerful ministries try to open and close doors with the world's help. They're going to use the battering ram or they're going to kick the door in when the Philadelphian church relies on God to open those doors or close those doors. Really neat stuff. That, li- that a little strength that he says really goes a long way because it gives you context, right? So let's look at this. He said, you have a little strength. You have not denied my name. You have kept my word. And again, this makes a lot of sense when you look at Christianity being spread around the world. And again, the mid-1700s, boy, in the, in the 20th century, the job of Christian missionaries was extremely difficult. You know, trying to break ground. What are the, what are the, um, the communist authorities going to think? You know, what are the socialist regimes? And they weren't favorable towards the Christians, but they did it anyway. Many of them lost their lives. Uh, you can read that in Fox's Book of Martyrs, but they still did it. They had a little strength. They didn't do, what the, you know, God's will by building and amassing an army or a huge bank account in the church. They did it by trusting the Lord, right? They didn't deny his name, you know, starting with Rome, the persecutions of Christians until today. And it's, it's increasing, So anybody who goes to the missions field and has done a little research realizes this could end really badly for me, but they do it anyway if they really feel the Lord is leading them. I love this. This church, as opposed to some big ministries with big footprints and big bravado, ostentatious, this church had a little strength. I know I keep saying that. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, even when he was suffering, he did the Lord's will. And he says, I have this thorn in the flesh. I asked the Lord three times to remove it. And the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So even the Apostle Paul that we all look up to, who wrote half the New Testament, had a little strength. There was something that plagued him that the Lord chose not to remove. Maybe it was to keep him humble. I don't know. There's a lot of speculation on that. You know, so Paul, the Apostle Paul, this great missionary, he went all over the place. Yeah, but you don't know how he suffered. But you know, all he could think of was, I just got to get the message of the gospel out. That was all he could think of. And boy, where he's been in the last 2,000 years, (laughs) can't wait to meet him. They kept his word. John 14, 23. If we go to John 14, 23. And this is important because this really is the reason for so many denominations because Christians don't necessarily know the entire word of God. I believe if every Christian knew the Bible more, there'd be less doctrinal and denominational differences, right? Jesus' words are right here. So in John 14, starting with verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, He will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So Jesus is saying right there, follow my teachings. You know, this was put down. It lasted 2,000 years for a reason. You know, Jesus is looking for that. Again, purity versus perfection. We'll never have perfection because we're sinners. But we can have purity in worship and doctrine. And we have to go back to the Word to find that. When Chuck Smith started Calvary Chapels, he, one of the things he said is, he said there's too much interdenominational focus. He goes, I'm trying to do something that's really more non-denominational and kind of bring people together, right, on the important things, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, things to that nature. So it's pretty neat stuff. Continuing on, verse 9, he says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Three, justice in the end. Now, we covered this in Smyrna. This is the second time he says it in addressing to the churches. And just... Because if you're new to the Bible, you just took a breath and you gasped when I read that. Again, you have to read it in context. When I taught this in Smyrna and he said the same thing, I could say people easily can make a comparison with 
a church today that's hateful, that hides behind their religion and hurts people. You can call that a church of Satan. And those people are hypocrites. So what Jesus is doing is he's exposing those that hide behind their religion and do evil things. It makes no sense at all. And I've even talked about some in the church age, in some Christian or pseudo-Christian or supposedly Christian organizations that killed people or forced them to convert. That's not what Jesus was looking for. You know, the overzealous religionist who even thinks in their delusion that they're pleasing God by harming other people. I always say this, I don't care what religion it is. Um, a forced conversion is no conversion at all because it has to come from the heart. Jesus never forced anybody to become a Christian. It makes no sense. He says, I will have them worship at your feet. Now, this is encouraging to them. Let's say what it's not. And if you look at the Greek, you can see some nuances in it. It doesn't mean that they're going to be worshipped. But what it means is, if you read it in its entirety, is that even if it's not until the judgment, those that have persecuted you, they're not from me, God says. They will be in a humiliating position. They will see that you were right, that what they did was evil. And he says, 9b, and to know that I have loved you. We're going to get to that. But you look at Acts 9 and you look at John 15, you see this, um, I don't know, converse or reflexive relationship where Jesus says, you know, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you because you're carrying my word. But also in Acts chapter 9, there's the other side. It's so cool. I love the scripture where the Lord was saying, if you persecute my followers, Paul, who was Saul, who was converted in Acts 9, you don't realize it, but you are persecuting me. Well, when have I ever done that? You, know, you just did it yesterday. You just arrested more Christians for worshiping me. So you see this conversion by the apostle Paul uh, in Acts chapter 9. And you see this uh, identification with Christ. And 9b is probably the most powerful part of this whole section is, and they will know that I have loved you. Again, we don't always see that here, but certainly all things are true and will be revealed when we're all in the kingdom. So Jesus is trying to tell them to hold on, to hold fast, to keep doing what you're doing. You're doing right, even though it doesn't seem like it from the world's perspective. So in verse 9b, and to know that I have loved you, you know, I think this, the last two or three months, you know, <laughs> It's people are waiting online, they can't get their hair cut, they can't get elective surgeries. I think we were thrust into a situation as Americans to really see what's really important and what's not important. And sometimes in shallow American Christianity, the prayers are always, what can I get from God? But he's saying, you know what's really important is to know that I love you. To me, that's important. If God says nothing else in his word and he says, I love you, I'm settled with that, right? And that's the things that what we have to see is the most important. And when we're suffering in life, to know that God loves us and to have that reinforced is extremely comforting. So continuing on, verse 10, he says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour or the time period of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. We're going to get to that. Which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So four out of five is present perseverance, future blessing. Now other churches were warned that if they didn't stop their behavior, they, they, would, they could call themselves Christians all they, all they wanted. They were going to go through the great tribulation because they didn't have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. So this church ends at the Harpazo or the rapture. If we could put up 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. He tells, the Apostle Paul tells the Thessalonian church, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so Jesus will bring with him those who sleep. 
in Jesus. For we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The Thessalonians were, you can surmise or extrapolate that they were wondering, did we miss the coming of the Lord? And Paul tells them, this is how it's going to happen. And he says to comfort one another with these words. Well, today, 2,000 years later, we can still comfort one another with these words. As the Lord interrupted human history 2,000 years ago, he will do again sometime in the future. We don't set dates. False religions do that. So this is an amazing thing, is that if you're faithful to the Lord, he will, in his time period, remove us before all these awful things happen on the earth in the book of Revelation, which we'll get to. And I think this is one of the best supporting scripture for the rapture or the harpazo, no matter how you want to look at it, whether it's Latin or Greek or how it was transliterated, um, this is that incredible time that we look forward to. I'll read verse 10 again. Again, it's, it's, he says, because you have kept my command to persevere. Now he's speaking to Christians, right? Through different ages. I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth. That's so important. This, is going to, this event is going to happen to the whole earth. It's going to be a trial to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, I've done this before with the different churches. I told you distinctly the differences between the harpazo or the rapture and the second coming. There's several distinct differences. There's actually there was a whole book written on it. Okay? And listen, we have to, we either are real, we're Christians or we're not. And if we are Christians, we believe what the Lord says in his word. So to test those on the earth, well, when the, when the Christians are removed and taken into heaven and there's the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we'll get to, those that left on the earth, that are left on the earth, will go through a very difficult time, a very grueling seven-year period where everything starts to collapse before the Lord remakes everything. They will be tried or they will be tested. Now, some on the earth, and we might know family members who we love dearly, who we give our life for, and they're so resistant to the things of God. The Lord took us today, which I'm not saying he is. Um, they would be left here. And the fact that we disappeared would hopefully get them to come to their senses. Because the Bible says that there will be tribulation saints. But they will be tested. They will be tried. Some will be, be found wanting. And they will thumb their nose at God all the way to the end. And others will be broken. And that's what you have when it comes to the things of God. There's always these two different paths. Jesus always talks about two paths. Well, we're Americans. We want a hundred paths. We want a lot of choice in America. Jesus said there's only two. So it's either this or it's that. When we're shown grace, we can either, the Bible tells us, we can either come to him or we can continue to resist him. When we're shown trials and things that will test the earth, we can either come to him or we can continue to resist. It's such a sad road when people resist all the way to the moment they die. But that's the way of mankind. God gave us free will. So he gives us this command to persevere and we can't give up. We can't give up. It doesn't mean that it doesn't come without tears. You know, for those of you who are watching on the live stream, you could be going through a situation right now that is really trying you, that is, you're going through such a difficulty. But if you don't know the Lord, I would say that you should accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You'll always have somebody walking with you. But even for those who are Christians, you know, we go through things, we know it's the right thing to do, but it can come with many tears. And everybody has those stories. But like Jesus said, be faithful to the end. Don't give up. Right? It is a reward at the end. Verse 11, he says, I am coming quickly. It means suddenly or unexpectedly. When the Lord does come, it will unravel very quickly at some point in time. It didn't mean he was coming any day now. It didn't support the preterist view. But it meant that when it happens, it's going to move very rapidly. Very rapidly. 
He says, hold fast or retain what you have. Don't give it up because you're doing right. Don't deviate. The Apostle Paul says, run the race to win. Sometimes, you know, you've seen this with maybe runners or people who do an athletic competition. They just give up. You know, they just, they're done. Yeah, and they probably could have done it, but they didn't push themselves to the end. So the Apostle Paul speaks about the uh, life of a believer and parallels it to running a race. He says, run the race to win. Don't let anybody take your victor's crown, which we also spoke about in the church of Smyrna. Verse 12, he speaks about being overcomers. Now, the Greek word means to prevail or get the, the victory, you know. So this is important because although we don't do things perfect, although we... St see, this is some issues when people teach the Bible. It's either this or it's that. It could be this and that at the same time. We were, that's our society, the false choice. choice. If you, you either believe what everyone's saying or you're a bad person or you want people to die or whatever the case may be. But two things can happen at the same time. You know, we have responsibility as believers. And that's a cool thing. I like that. God's given us a big brain. He encourages us through his word. He tells us not to give up. He tells us to run the race to win. He tells us to hold fast. But at the same time, he says, but I'm with you and I love you. And when you fall, I'll help you get back up. When you call out to me, I'll hear. Two things can happen at the same, and some people fall in the extremes. You know, the couch potato Christians like to fall on the the verses that are so soothing and, and mesmerizing, and I just I could just sit here and not do anything the rest of my life. That's a problem. <laughs> and then you have the others who are maybe type A and driven, and we're doing, 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 but we're also not giving enough credit to the Lord about how we do accomplish things. I think one of the things I've appreciated after teaching the Bible for so many years is the fact that we can do two things at the same time, folks. Our personal lives, our emotional lives, our spiritual lives, what's going on today. We can do two things at the same time. You can do it. He speaks about that we would be like pillars with a new name written on it. A pillar, if you've ever, I've never seen them up front, the ruins, but I've seen them on pictures. And there are these incredibly like, like a concrete or stone column and from the ancient ruins, sometimes from 2,000 years ago, sometimes from three and 4,000 years ago. They'd just been standing that whole time. Now, in some countries, there were bombings during World War II. They're still there. In some countries, there were earthquakes, and they're still there. The roof might be gone, the walls might be gone, but the pillars are still there. So God brings that up for a reason. And sometimes we look at ourselves like Gideon goes, you know, Gideon was, was afraid. We look at ourselves and go, oh, that's not me. I'm not a pillar. God says you can be a pillar, right? <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. The apostles were pillars of the early church with Jesus as the cornerstone. And we can be a pillar too. Don't look in the mirror and, and make a judgment about yourself by what you see physically. Look in the word, look in that mirror and see what God can make you into. Amen? So, he spoke about the new names written on the pillars. Um, it, it, back in the ancient, again, going back to these pillars, it's not easy to see from a picture, but if you've ever been to some of these places, you could see if you look up real close, I mean, it, there's erosion, but on these pillars are names. There's not, they're not just de uh, designs in the pillars, but names are written. So certainly the Lord takes what he knows about the known world and he for us, 2,000 years later, it's a little murky, but we can work our way through it, especially when we understand history. And the names would be either the name of the builder or the name of uh, a dignitary, somebody extremely important. And this is a cool thing because God loves us so much that he's saying, look at those pillars, look at the names. I want to make you that in my kingdom. I want to make you that in my kingdom. Very exciting. He speaks about the new Jerusalem that comes down. And uh, I'm excited to see that. We're going to get into that. I, I, I did some research. This city that comes out of the heavens, that's this cubicle city. It's 1,400 uh, cubic miles. Yeah. So it's sort of like from here to Florida, length, width, and depth. We'll talk about that when we get to it. 
But one day we're going to see it, <laughs> so we don't have to just talk about it. All encouraging stuff, you know. Five out of five is the conclusion. Dead or alive, Sardis or Philadelphia? Christian faith, dead or alive? God was so merciful even to Sardis that he said, you know, I'm going to give you a chance to revive what's dying. And I'm going to be part of that resurrection process. That's the beauty of the Lord. He was resurrected because he wanted to give us life. He can also resurrect things in our lives that seem to be dead and lifeless. You've got to give it to the Lord and you've got to trust him. You know, for those of us that are alive, well, we're commended by the Lord, but we also have a responsibility to keep going. For those that are dying, well, the Lord always gives the ability to get right. Remember, what Philadelphia is not, what is, what is not Philadelphia? And sometimes we eisegete, we read into the scripture, we look at what's going on maybe in our culture, and we read that into the word, which is always going to get us the wrong equation. Philadelphia, the church, was not enormous. It wasn't a celebrity ministry with wealthy people who have hangers full of jets. It wasn't a political and financially clout uh, type of church. It didn't have armies and navies. It didn't brag about doing big things. Philadelphia was a Christian mindset. It was a way of life. Folks, <clears throat> Sometimes through adversity, God shows us things. And certainly we've been going through a roller coaster over the last few months. But be open to what the Lord says in his word. Because, you know, sometimes when I, I go through the book of Revelation, people get so excited. They want to hear about, you know, Revelation. They want to hear about you know, the mark of the beast. What do you, you know, there's a million different ideas. Is this the mark of the beast? And I would just say, let's enjoy where we are in the churches. Because that stuff will come, but this is something that follows us day by day. We can either be that Philadelphian monolith, we can run that, and some of you are tired. Oh man, you know, talk about running a race. Some of you spiritually, your knee blew out. You know, you're, I know runners, thrown up on yourself, you know. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of things you could be going through right now, but trust the living God. Because if he says it can happen, it can happen. And I'm going to tell you, in my life, speaking of the open and closed doors, I've prayed for things and I try to get through that door and the Lord just slammed it shut. And it was only maybe 10 years later, maybe a year in certain situations that I realized, you know what, I'm glad he closed that door. What, what was I thinking when I was praying that prayer? Or you're trying something so hard. You're trying to achieve something and the door just seems like it's welded shut. And then the Lord takes that loving hand and he just pulls it open and says, walk through it. So I want to encourage you with that. The imagery, you know, not all the Christians who read this were super educated, but they could understand the, the imagery. And that's the beautiful thing about God. That's the beautiful thing, what I love about Jesus and the parables. You didn't have to have any education. He could say, hey, do you see that garden? Let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. Hey, you see that wedding processional going on? Let me make an analogy with the kingdom of heaven. So folks, I'm going to miss Philadelphia because I'm going to be in this crummy church next Sunday of Laodicea. But if nothing else, it'll tell us what we shouldn't be. But I think more than ever, in our time period, we need to be Philadelphian Christians. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you're so awesome. You're so good. And uh, Lord, we love your word. Lord, this is how powerful your word is. For 2,000 years, we've had Christians that have spoken different languages have eaten different foods, have had different cultures. And what you share in your word about these churches is timeless. It doesn't matter where we find ourselves in human history. We can learn so much about the seven churches. So I just pray if there's anybody uh, watching the live stream who, you know, I don't know, there's a million different reasons why people could be watching the live stream. But I just want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, it's okay that you're not physically present here. You're in your pajamas, you're on your couch, you're, you're, and you're getting serious. You're like listening to the word and you're like, wow, I never read this before. This is touching my heart. Just give your life to Jesus. The words are really not important, but he did die for your sins. And you have to accept that sacrifice to be saved because something has to happen with our sins that destroy us 
and separate us from the living God. But Jesus paid that price. So I want to encourage you, if you're home, just cry out to him. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner. I need a Savior. I believe what you did on the cross, dying for my sins. I know that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one gets to heaven, the Father, without you. Lord, I look forward to you filling me with your Holy Spirit. 